to order. This hearing is taking place pursuant to Rule 10.01 and can be viewed through the House webcast. Ms. Annum, please take the roll for attendance. Chair Moran. Present. Vice Chair Olson. Present. Representative Garofalo, excused. Representative Albright. Albright, present. Representative Becker Finn. Present. Representative Bernardi. Excused. Present. Representative Bernardi. Present. Present. Representative Eckland. Present. Representative Hansen. Present. Representative Hassan. Representative Hurtas. Hurtas present. Representative Hornstein. Hornstein present. Representative Johnson. Present. Representative Krisha. Representative Liebley. Present. Representative Lilly. Lilly present. Representative Mariani. Representative Marquardt. Present. Representative Miller. Present. Representative Nash. Present. Representative Nelson. Present. Representative Noor. Present. Representative O'Neill. Present. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski present. Representative Petersburg. Present. Representative Pinto. Present. Representative Schumacher. Schumacher present. Representative Schultz. Present. Representative Scott. Present. Representative Sundin. Present. Okay. Representative Hassan. Representative Krisha. And Representative Mariani. Madam Chair, a quorum is present. So a quorum is present, and our first agenda item is approval of the minutes from our previous hearing. The meetings were provided in members' package and posted online. Vice Chair Olson, can I get a motion to approve the minutes for April the 21st, 2022? So moved, Madam Chair. Are there any questions or corrections to, the, to these minutes? If not, all in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. So this morning, members, we have three bills on the agenda. We will meet until 1045, and then we'll recess for session, and then come back at 1 or at the call of the chair to finish the agenda. First up is Chair Hansen with the Supplemental Environmental and Natural Resource Omnibus Bill. Um, so, just for informational purpose, Senate File 4062 came to us from the floor yesterday, so we'll need to work from the Senate File. Uh, members, this bill would move separately to line up with the Senate and conference. We have a couple of procedural motions to get the bill before the committee um, in the shape that the author would like to present it. So, Chair Hansen, would you like to move Senate File 4062? to be recommended for placement on the general register. Yes, Madam Chair, I would move that Senate File 4062 be recommended for placement on the general register. All right, so let's get the, language, the House language before the committee. Uh, any questions on the Hansen motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Madam Chair. Aye. Madam Chair. Say nay. The motion prevails. Okay, Chair Hansen, you ha also have an author's amendment. Well, I, I believe we have to, I move to, uh, delete the language in Senate File 4062 and insert the contents of the House Companion, House File 4492, the first engrossment. Is that correct, Madam Chair? Okay. Are there any questions on the amendment? Seeing no further questions to the A1 amendment, it's before us. All those in favor? Madam Chair? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. Collins. You you are on the motion to delete the Senate language and insert the House language. That is correct. Thank you, Ms. Conley. Um, so I, um, so you moving to delete. Okay, so no questions. Um, so let's get that language <laughs> before the body here. Um, and there any questions on that motion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No. 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 The motion prevails. Chair Hansen, you also have the author's amendment. Yes. So why don't we move that? Felt kind of good to delete the Senate language, didn't it? Uh, <clears throat> I move the A1 amendment, uh, and I uh, can describe that. This is the A1 amendment to the Senate file, 4062, as amended. Are there any questions? to the amendment. 
Seeing no further questions, the A1 amendment is before us. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion prevails. Okay. Um, so Senate file 4062 as amended is now before us. Chair Hansen, please continue with your presentation of your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. This is the Omnibus uh, Environment Finance Bill. Uh, it has a number of provisions in it. A couple key themes is uh, this bill rights some past wrongs. Some of those wrongs occurred almost uh, two decades ago uh, during the Plenty administration when we had to make some cuts to existing programs. And one of those programs was the Metropolitan Landfill Contingency Action Trust, or MLCAT. And about $13 million were taken to balance the budget with a promise to pay it back and it's never been paid back. And so what this bill does is it pays it back uh, with the interest. Why is that important? There are a number of metro landfill sites that this fund was set up to handle for cleanup. And without this money going back into the fund, uh, that those funds are not available as these landfills age. And as landfills age, they leak. And so this fund needs to be restored in order to uh, make it whole so that it's available. These are fees that metro area uh, uh, residents have paid into for years and they haven't been paid back. This bill pays them back. Also in the early 2000s, in 2003 and 2005, there's a lottery in lieu tax uh, on uh, sale of lottery tickets. And that was 97% of that was dedicated uh, to go to the environment when it was set up. That was cut to 72% of the lottery and new tax. And so the rest of that goes into the general fund. So in the tails on this bill, we restore that dedication back to 97% from the 72%. Uh, and then we, it, we don't change how it's allocated. It goes into the same allocations formula, but we increase that pie. So that is where the tails are at about $13 million. Uh, there's a significant in investment in conservation. We put uh, $30 million into the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. So often when we think of CREP or the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, we think of an acre amount. But the contract with the federal government is actually a dollar amount. And we can uh, maximize $2 of federal, federal money coming in for every dollar we spend and have that opportunity during the next two years uh, before that contract uh, expires. We provide $10 million for a CRP and state incentive so that uh, landowners who want to participate in CRP have a competitive rental rate uh, compared to the going market rate. We have a whole, a whole article on contaminants uh, with PFAS and those of us in the legislature have been dealing with PFAS for many years. Um, we have a provisions protecting Minnesota from these harmful forever chemicals. Prohibiting PFAS in children's products, cosmetics, ski wax, firefighting foam, cookware, and home and commercial furnishings. Requiring disclosure of PFAS on products sold in the state. Establishing water quality standards for PFAS. And then with lead, and there is no safe level of lead for people, uh, replacing lead service lines, which are generally found in older homes in lower income communities. We put some money into that. Environmental justice. Uh, Chair Lee has had, for several years, worked on environmental justice involving community in environmental justice and air monitoring equipment. So think of all the money we have spent on monitoring for water quality in the last two or three decades. But we have not had that same equivalent uh, for air quality monitoring. This bill uh, starts that and en enhances it, so we we're looking at air quality issues, uh, which are go hand in hand with environmental justice concerns. <clears throat> we have a number of fiscal agents, uh, fiscal uh, items for the agencies, and I'd like to note that we are not uh, completely aligned with the agencies. We have different priorities than many of the agencies. Uh, we have included some of the agency provisions, but not all of them. Uh, this bill goes, uh, it provides and established a pig's eye landfill task force. Going back to uh, writing past wrongs, uh, right in the center of the city here, we have the pig's eye landfill, right down along the river, and it's a dump. And Battle Creek goes through that, that, uh, that dump. And with changes in climate, we're seeing increased water velocity come out of Battle Creek and increased volume. It's tearing that old dump apart. 
And where does the water go? Right in the Mississippi River. So um, we want to establish a task force. And those of you who've been here a while know I'm not that excited about task forces, but this provides a platform uh, for us to hopefully work with and achieve some federal dollars because this is going to be a large cleanup project. It's going to involve multiple agencies that are going to have to be working together with the community on cleaning up uh, Pig's Eye landfill. Um, we provide, uh, I'm going to focus on the little agencies because they often are forgotten. We provide an additional half a million dollars to the Conservation Corps of Minnesota and another 250K in the base to help the work. That's a way to get people involved in the outdoors and outdoor careers. Metropolitan Council, I talked about uh, the lead service lines. We also have inflow infiltration grants and uh, provide for metropolitan parks. Uh, the Minnesota Zoo, we provide some money to continue the groundbreaking butterfly conservation. The Science Museum, who took a real hit during, the, uh, during COVID, uh, we provide a one-time increase of 500000 to help uh, get folks back to the Science Museum. Explore Minnesota Tourism. Wherever you are around the state, uh, there are community events and community activities. We provide $10 million from the general fund to jumpstart tourism. Tourism recovery grants, and then 250K specifically for the Grand Portage Band and for additional administrative capacity. We establish a Minnesota Outdoor Recreation Office to help with this continuing outdoor effort. Um, we provide money to the University of Minnesota for a soil health action plan. And there are just a number of additional programs, policies, projects, and important funding here to help right the past wrongs and lay a foundation for the future. I can't end without thanking our awesome committee staff, Janelle Taylor and Bob Elith from House Research, Fiscal Analyst Brad Hagemeyer, Committee Administrator Peter Strohmeyer, Committee Legislative Assistant Scotland Cracker, and Partisan Researchers Molly Peterson and Amy Zipko. We would not be able to do this work without them. And with that, I would stand for questions. Well, thank you, Chair Hansen, um, for that detailed um, presentation. So there's no other amendments that were pre-filed. Are there any questions? Representative Hotas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Hansen, and thank you for uh, taking efforts with regard to uh, studying the rough fish report. Um, there's more damage, and I shouldn't say more damage, but there's significant damage being done to water quality with regard to rough fish and the turbulence that they do to the bottom of the lake and, and streams in particular. So looking forward to that. Um, seeing that improvement. But I was wondering, I didn't uh, see a number, um, and maybe you can put a number to the comment about restoring the allocation of, of lottery proceeds from the 70s to the 97 percentile based on uh, reoccurring lottery sales. Can you put a number on what that might mean? Sure, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Representative Hurtas. It's about 13 million. I could have uh, Mr. Hagermeyer find the line item if you'd like, but it's ongoing, and obviously it's going to probably increase as lottery sales will increase. But right now, it's about 13 million. Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Representative Hansen. Uh, given the fiscal condition of the state, it's time to restore that. So thank you for that. Was there a question in it? I think it was agreement, so I'll, okay. I'll just, I'll be happy with it. <laughs> Even better, okay. Um, are they represent, uh, Chair Baker fans. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I just wanted to clarify on the, the rough fish provision that we're actually talking about native rough fish um, and not our invasive species. Uh, basically, there's no scientific distinction between a rough fish and a game fish, so kind of uh, in the weeds uh, on uh, talking about fish, but it's a good provision to have in the bill. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Hansen, for the bill. There are some good things in here, and I might be a more unusual Republican sitting at the table. I care a lot about the things that are in here. But there are some things that go a little bit further than even I would take them, and there's some policy changes, and I wanted to know how it relates to the budget. There's, there's a big change in here about permitting people to drive a motorboat, and you didn't mention that. I'm assuming we're gonna have to stand up more infrastructure to be able to permit 
adults now because we currently permit under the age of 17. So, or excuse me, under, under the age of 18. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit about what your plan is in this bill to require adults to also have a permit to drive a boat and what is the cost to set up the infrastructure to do that because it's there's some testing involved and so on. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative O'Neill. So that was a Representative Cagle bill, uh, and it's looking at providing training for boater safety. Um, I just picked up some boater safety materials from the DNR for Earth Day this week, and people really enjoyed picking those up. Um, I think the fiscal note on that, I would uh, defer to uh, Mr. Hagermeyer, but um, you know, there, the whole issue with wakes and boater safety and all that. There's a variety of interests, whether they're the lake associations, whether they're the boat manufacturers, uh, whether it's the DNR, but it seemed what everybody could agree on is that there was a need for more training and education. And so providing that boater safety training uh, is something that, ca that people can do to help, not only uh, environmentally, but also for that personal watercraft safety. Um, so I don't have that exact number in front of me, but uh, Mr. Hagermeyer may have that in the line item. Mr. Hagermeyer. Madam Chair, Representative Hansen um, and representatives, I just pulled up the fiscal note for that. It's House File 3787 is what it went into that bill. The amount of money requested by the DNR was nothing for this bill. They already do a bunch of it under their current permitting structure. There was a little bit of a, um, a little bit going to the public safety department through their restricted miscellaneous special revenue fund, but that would be statutorily appropriated. So there was no appropriation requested in the fiscal note for the DNR to carry out the functions of post file 3787, which is the provisions you're talking about now. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, that explains why I couldn't find it as a line mm -hmm. item. I was really curious because you're going to be standing up infrastructure for not just all the youth that now have to be licensed, but think about all of the adults that now have to be licensed. And I do see that it's a tiered approach. Uh, I, I do see that. And I think many of us at the table would not meet that tier for quite some time, it looks like. so. Um, Okay. Oh, also, what is the cost for the permit? Mr. Hansen, or uh, Madam Chair, I do not have that off the top of my head. I think that's going to be rolled into the existing program. Um, I know there are folks from DNR here that could answer that question. Is there someone in the audience who can re respond to Representative O'Neill's question around the cost? Mr. Hagemeyer? Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know the exact cost of the permit. A lot of it is done through a vendor that uh, contracts with the state, and it's just their their cost for, I believe, running the program. I do not know exactly what the permit costs. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the Ways and Means Committee. Please introduce yourself. Good morning, Madam Chair. For the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. This outdoor recreation training program is similar to our training programs we have currently for off-road vehicles, motorcycles, snowmobiles, ATVs. It currently is a voluntary program for children between 12 and 17. It's $25 that goes to the vendor to, to they produce the training uh, program. It's online, also available in paper copy. So those funds go to the vendor and they provide those services. And it's the same as all the other training programs that we operate. Okay, thank you. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So you're saying that right now it's a voluntary program, but isn't this bill changing it so that it's a mandatory um, permit in order to operate a motor vehicle or a, a boat? Commissioner Myers. Madam Chairman, Representative, yes. Uh, uh, to provide education, safety, and training, we've, we've seen record numbers of injuries and fatalities these past couple of years and also record numbers of people buying motorized and non-motorized boats. So working with the industry and user groups in the legislature, actually this came from the user groups, Minnesota, the National Marine Manufacturers Association and the Lakes and Rivers Association supporting this pr proposal to provide mandatory education for people using motorized boats rather than voluntary and also provide an educational effort to help um, children tell their parents how to operate boats correctly. Mm. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, we're learning so much this morning. I didn't realize that we're going from a voluntary program to a mandatory program and including um, quite a few adults. I mean, it's quite a long list of, it's tiered in, but it's by age and, and so on. So 
Um, and is it still then a $25 permit, but now it's mandatory before you, so, so let's ask it this way. So what would be the recourse? Um, what would the DNR do if they came upon a boater that did not have a permit after this goes into effect? That was in the correct age category. Commissioner Myers. Madam Chair, Representative, uh, there will be a substantial educational effort to make sure that people are aware of the requirements. And as I've said before, these are required to operate a snowmobile, an ATV, uh, off-road motorcycle, or to hunt, and, and hunt on, on state lands. You have to be trained and certified if you're over 12 years old. So it's just an extension of our current programs to help provide safety. And as I said, training is the main thing um, to make sure that people are operating these motor boats safely and incorrectly correct methods on the waters of the state. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what the penalty was because I'm sure there was some sort of penalty for not having a permit. I'm, Madam Chair, Representative, Myers. the penalty, what I was trying to state is that for several years there will be an educational effort. There will be no penalties involved. Uh, penalties of the game and fish, uh, anything under the game and fish code is a, is a misdemeanor to come out to start with. So we would gradle, gradually increase that. So it will be the same penalty as there would be um, without um, hunting or operating an ATV without safety training as well. Representative O'Neill. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. We got to the end of it. All right, thank you. All right, thank um, you. So I, I apologize. I was going to ask another question. Oh, you have more. Okay, <laughs> Representative O'Neill. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. I didn't mean to speak over you. Um, so let's move on to the enforcement authority of the DNR, maybe, oh, he already left, um, for appropriating water. And it looks like we're increasing penalties here as well, and I wanted to know the fiscal cost because we're doubling the current administrative penalties from 20,000 to 40,000. Um, it can be forgiven if things are corrected, but it has to do with appropriating water. And I'm wondering if you could tell us, <laughs> you can bring him back, <laughs> tell us what the fiscal cost is, or not cost, but the uh, revenue generated from doubling that administrative penalty from 20000 to 40000 regarding appropriating water. Commissioner Myers. Madam Chair, Representative. Um, the penalty in that bill, it's, a, it's actually an administrative penalty order bill that we worked with Representative Becker Finn on to deal, dealing with large um, issues of, of water misappropriation in the millions of gallons. The, the original APO authority that we had was, was crafted around irrigators, farmers who would be appropriating water without permits and things like that. It was a $2,000 forgivable fine. Uh, over the course of the past couple years, dealing with large water appropriations and large projects across the state, uh, we realized we don't have the tools in the toolbox to, to deal with challenges that may come up where people may be misappropriating millions and millions of gallons of water. So we worked with the legislature, uh, the House uh, authors, and Mr. Han Chairman Hansen to, to get this language into the bill to give us the tools we need to enforce when we do have loss of millions and millions of gallons of water. The penalties that are in the bill would, would I would hope, not never have to be used, but it is a tool that we would use against permit uh, holders if they come in violation. And we have the infrastructure in place right now and it's just increasing the limits of our program that we have. So there is no administrative cost associated with the language. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I understand there's probably no administrative cost, but I was just wondering the revenue generated when you're doubling the penalty. I wonder if there was a fiscal note, Chair Hansen. Madam that Chair. is a question. Okay, Commissioner uh, Myers. Madam Chair, Representative, it's, it's hard to estimate what the revenue is going to be off of a violation. We hope to never have to use this language. So you can tell what the penalties are in the bill and the number of days it would take to, to get an issue resolved. But I, I can't forecast into the future the violations of a, of a permittee and what, those gener what the revenue might generate. Madam I Chair. think maybe um, Representative uh, Chair Becker can respond to this. I, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. And, um, uh, maybe maybe explaining it in this way will be helpful for you, uh, Representative O'Neill. So part of the idea and the way I explained it in committee is that when there are stricter penalties, similar to with my kids, when I'm very clear about what the what the consequences are going to be, we hope to get better uh, compliance with the law so that by people knowing what those penalties are going to be. And so there is not a fiscal note because hopefully we'll never have to actually leverage one of these against people because hopefully these large permittees will be following the rules. And now that we've got 
a duty of candor. We've got some other penalties built in. Hopefully, they're not going to be doing those violations the way that they have in the past. So there is not a fiscal note for the bill. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So increasing penalties reduces bad behavior. Got it. Um, okay. Then there's also a section that says civil penalty. Civil penalties are now allowed. Um, penalties as high as ten thousand per day. I'm assuming it's for the same. So if you're violating um, permit conditions, inspection conditions, rules adopted under this chapter, stipulation agreements, or commissioner's orders, uh, can you tell me what the fiscal note is revenue generated from civil penalties up to $10,000 per day for a person, not an entity? Commissioner Myers. Hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Madam Chairman, Representative. That's a hypothetical question that I, I don't have an answer for. It would depend on the length of the violation and the number of days that it occurred. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we don't want a fiscal note for that either. Okay. Um, okay, and then it goes on. It can go to the district court. So I guess if they're really bad, then they'll take them and go to court. Okay, we'll just leave that there. Um, so let's talk about PFAS a little bit here. Uh, I understand that these large provisions went through uh, Commerce. Um, I used to serve on Commerce, and I remember we had many bills relating to that sort of thing. I don't necessarily disagree with the concept, but again, what that does is it makes patchwork across all the different states, which makes it very problematic um, for anybody buying, selling, manufacturing, any of those sorts of things. And we're not just adding one or two categories. You're adding huge categories. In fact, I'm not even sure what you may have left out. Um, and again, I'm not. I'm I'm a person that buys, you know, uh, ceramic and things like that when I'm cooking, and, and I'm very careful and cautious of any kind of chemicals introduced into my life. I appreciate that. But can you just speak to like how many states have this level? of restriction on, on these products? Um, is it one, is it a hundred, you know, is it 10? Like how many other states are like what we're trying to do here in Minnesota and, and how difficult will it be to do interstate commerce because of it? Chair Hanson. Madam Chair and uh, Representative O'Neill, you know, I think it was uh, Louis Brandeis who said that the state through the laboratory is for democracy. And so one person's patchwork is another person's innovation. And so there are states uh, that are there's a variety of states that are doing things with PFAS. Uh, they're looking at a menu of things. There's things that states are doing that we may not be doing. Um, last year, we did uh, a ban on pack food packaging, and we phased that in over time. So I know there are states on that type of thing that have uh, maybe doing a different schedule of phasing, as well as different products. So I think what's important here is you have a menu. You have a whole article on PFAS. And so it looks at a variety of projects, ski wax. I would think in Minnesota that we could agree that maybe we shouldn't have PFAS in ski wax. Now, unless there's a PFAS uh, association, a PFAS in ski wax manufacturers board or something that is out there lobbying against uh, taking PFAS out of ski wax, I mean, I would think that'd be something we could agree with. It doesn't seem to be an essential component. Same thing with cosmetics. Do we need PFAS in cosmetics? So what you have in front of you, you know, Minnesota has been a leader in the environment. And there are other states that are being leaders. And as this moves through, you're going to see that I mean, your input is valuable. We'll have that debate as well. And with the Senate, they don't have many of these provisions. But last year, we were able to come to a compromise and actually ban PFAS in food packaging. These forever chemicals are with us forever. And so the best way to deal with them is to prevent them from getting into us and into the environment. So if they're not essential, maybe we shouldn't have them. And we could lead on that. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, OK, thank you, uh, Chair Hansen. I didn't really hear like would even one other state that has and again, I don't disagree with, I, per, I personally purchase products without PFAS and I, I do everything I can to remove chemicals from my you know, skincare products and my cooking, my clothing, all of these sorts of things. Um, so I, I understand the concept. I'm just, I'm concerned, one, about the infrastructure in Minnesota 
because uh, you're going to have to do, and the agency is going to have to do testing and, and uh, penalties and things like that to actually enforce it. So the, the enforcement side. So I have, I have two questions. I'm going to come back to if you know other states that are doing this uh, so that we have better interstate commerce, makes it a little bit easier. But more importantly, how, do, how much does it cost to stand up this huge program of now banning all of these substances? Again, I'm not opposed to... Uh, especially a consumer purchasing products that don't have those in them. I completely understand that, but just what's the cost of the infrastructure to stand up all of this? Uh, and then what other states are actually doing this? Sure, yes. Madam Chair, and uh, some states that are leaders in PFAS uh, work, uh, North Carolina has been doing a lot. Mm -hmm. The federal government has co been coordinating there. Uh, the federal EPA uh, director is a past uh, leader in the North Carolina uh, Department of Environmental Quality. So there's been quite a bit of effort in North Carolina. Maryland, um, I believe last year on the food packaging and then on some of these similar types of things has been there. New Hampshire in the past has been active in this. Uh, Michigan, uh, I believe Washington State, all of them have had a variety. Some may not have all these, some may have some different things. Uh, but there's quite a bit of effort going on as well as at the federal government uh, working with manufacturers to try to uh, eliminate this. In terms of the products, uh, we have uh, a phased in implementation date where the agency is there. I believe there are people from the MPCA uh, who could address any potential uh, fiscal consequences with that. Representative yeah. O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I would love to hear what the cost is to stand this up because it seems very expansive. You've got carpet, textiles, cookware, cosmetics, juvenile products, uh, ski wax. That's got to cost quite a bit to monitor all of those products. Since we're not doing this across the nation, it makes it much more difficult for the state of Minnesota. Maybe we have some help here. Uh, welcome to the Ways and Means Committee. Can you please introduce yourself and proceed? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and for the record, my name is Tom Johnson, uh, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, we have, uh, uh, Chair Hansen has been kind enough to update the, uh, the costs that, um, uh, that we have estimated for implementing these uh, PFAS provisions um, in, in his amendment, in the A1 amendment. So that would represent the costs that we feel um, are representative. Uh, mostly that would involve, uh, in the past, our enforcement of these provisions would uh, include education for um, the manufacturers and retailers. Uh, it would involve um, purchasing some products uh, that, that we think may uh, be not in compliant with these provisions and then uh, testing those products. Um, and then it would include obviously uh, the actual, you know, keeping staff on hand to do those activities. So it's the, the but the actual fiscal information is in the A1 amendment. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I have the A1, but just for the public, could you just let us know what that total cost is and then what the tails cost would be as you're standing up the program? Mr. Uh, Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. Uh, so it, I'm seeing 2024, uh, uh, $598,000, uh, 2025 and later is $928,000. And then $165,000 may be transferred to the Commissioner of Health because we do um, work with the Department of Health on these matters. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we've got, if I do back of the envelope math, maybe. 55 or so employees to begin with and getting close to 100 new employees out in the tails. That's, I mean, that's what those numbers equate to unless you have some other I idea of how many FTEs. I do Mr. not Johnson. believe that's accurate. I can, uh, I do not have the FTEs in front of me right now. If you, I can look, find that information fairly quickly though, however. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, that's all right, thank you. Um, let's move on. Thank you for that. Uh, let's move on. Um, I'll ask a couple more questions, and I believe my colleague here has got a couple questions as well. 
Uh, just really quickly, there's also a provision in here that prohibits the importation, manufacture, or, or sale of products containing lead or cadmium. And you have a whole long list in the bill. I won't go into all of those. But there was something that wasn't on the list I found interesting because there's something that we're putting all over the landscape of Minnesota in great numbers that contain both lead and cadmium, um, at, you know, a considerable amount. It's one of the components that make them work. And I'm just wondering if you had any uh, conversation, not necessarily about um, importation or putting it up, but solar panels have got those very, very toxic metals in them. And if they are broken in any way, they leach into the ground underneath. Um, and we've had quite a bit of issue, especially in Wright County, with of uh, solar developers coming uh, in great numbers to put solar panels up there. And we've we've had to, as a community, make sure that there's a decommissioning plan, there's a cleanup plan. And I'm just wondering if in this, as you're prohibiting all these other um, items, that you've had any conversation about solar panels, because those two in particular are very prevalent in solar panels. Oh, he's going to come back Thank up. You. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. And as, as Mr. Johnson's coming up. So the, the provision is an agency uh, initiative. There was also a proposal looking at solar panel recycling, uh, and there was uh, it's not that is not in the bill because we feel felt there ne needed to be more work done on that uh, in terms of how do we. Uh, it's just going to take more time figuring out uh, how that would work. So there were discussions about that, uh, but uh, Mr. Johnson can discuss the the components why that's in the bill. Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Representative Hanson. Yeah, that's, that is correct. Um, uh, once again, uh, Tom Johnson, Government Relations, MPCA. Uh, the, uh, we had had conversations about this topic uh, with, uh, the, um, with the manufacturers and with uh, legislators. And at the end of the day, we felt that this item, the product stewardship that the governor had proposed uh, in, in his recommendations was not quite ready for, uh, for prime time. So more work is needed, and we appreciate the conversations that have happened this year so far. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, great. So, well, the last time I was at the National Laboratory, uh, National Science Laboratory in Idaho Falls, I don't know if you've been there before, but they are the premier developer and researcher in the, in the United States. Um, they're doing all kinds of things. Solar panels that you can roll up like a piece of film, um, hydrogen storage, um, small modular nuclear. But it, when I was there last, which was now just before COVID, I'll be going back again in June. Uh, I asked the director there about recycling solar panels because obviously if we're going to roll them out, we should have an end of life plan. And I was dismayed that he said, well, we can do it at the bench, but there, it's not commercially viable. That was, I'll give you, that was three years ago and I'll be back in June to find out if there's any progress been made. But they can do it at the bench. There was absolutely, at least that time, there was absolutely no ability to uh, recycle them and pull out these very toxic materials. But my question actually is, since you're there, so again, we're doing a big um, standing up of a new program that would prohibit the manufacture, the sale, and the importation of products, and a very long list of products, mind you, of lead and cadmium. And can you just tell me the cost, the fiscal note of that? and what the, the ensuing penalties might be, so if there's any revenue generated. Uh, I believe Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one second while I pull that up, that information up. Madam Chair, as he's doing that, uh, uh, Representative O'Neill, I. I think we agree on something, that it is easier to prevent than to clean up. And that's why some of these things, you know, whether it's solar panels or PFAS or some of the other contaminants we're talking about in here, having that plan ahead of time, you know, that having a life cycle analysis and having that is important. So, I mean, I think there's an opportunity for consistency here in terms of how do we deal with these contaminants because it is always better to
prevent the problem from occurring. We see this all over. We're going to be spending a lot of money in here dealing with PFAS and with microplastics and with a variety of other chemicals and, a, and also some biological contaminants. So prevention is better than cleanup. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just as he's trying to find the, the fiscal cost in the in the revenue generated, um, uh, uh, Chair Hansen, I actually, you and I, you'd be surprised how much you and I actually agree on these things. I think where we divert the, the agreement is when we're doing, so really these things should be federal so that it's consistent across the United States. I agree one wholeheartedly. Um, the the impetus of this bill is fact, we want healthy soil, we want healthy water, uh, we don't want chemicals in our products. I agree wholeheartedly. I'm just debating with you a little bit about the implementation and the fact that if Minnesota does it and North Dakota doesn't, South Dakota doesn't, Iowa doesn't, Wisconsin doesn't, you know, we're uh, an outlier and it makes it difficult. Um, so that's that's my concern. I would love to see these things happen at the federal level and not at the, you know patchwork of states. But in any case, you'd be surprised at how much we actually agree. I'm, I'm thinking he may have our number of the stand-up cost uh, and then any revenue generated from penalties. Um, Mr. Johnson, and if not, maybe we can get that later on because we do have a very full agenda. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, and yes, I, I will provide that specific number uh, later uh, to the representative and the committee. But I will just note that this is an existing program. It's it's uh, amending a, a current lead and cadmium restriction in children's products. Mm -hmm. So that program does exist. There will be less of a, a fiscal impact than uh, in fact, I'm seeing that I don't know that we had a fiscal note on, uh, on lead and cadmium. Oh, so. That's why I didn't see it. <laughs> All right. This, last question? Uh, so I don't have any more questions, okay. Madam Chair. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, and then we'll have a quick close. Yeah. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I, I'm really glad that this, this topic came up and we're having this discussion. I've had a bill for solar, uh, a solar stewardship panel um, Program. I've had that bill patterned after the, um, the electronics um, stewardship program for a very long time. I've asked for hearings over the years, never gotten one. The current bill number is 3351, in case you're interested. Um, and I, I think it's really important. These solar panels, the program has been around long enough now that a lot of these solar panels have reached the end of their life, and we have to figure out what we're going to do with them. I had a gigantic cleanup in my district, as you all know, Peg's Pit, the, um, the infamous Peg's Pit. But um, stuff was dumped there years ago, and it was leaching into the groundwater. And, and this is the kind of stuff that we don't want um, leaching into our groundwater and causing issues um, and con contamination issues. And I. I don't know why, you know, I was super glad to see that the, the governor had something in his, in his um, budget to address this. Because um, I think it's really important. If you're really, truly um, for green energy then, and for the environment, why in the world are we just now talking about this and, and, and the bill that the governor proposed wasn't ready for prime time? Well. I don't know where the agencies and um, folks that are really, this is one of their top topics, have been all these years, but um, we're kind of behind the eight ball in this. And I found it really interesting also that on the ban of things with PFAS is that solar panels are not included there either. The top film layer of solar panels is PFAS, made of PFAS. So I find it really interesting and this is, I guess, more of a comment than a question that, that we're just now getting here with this. Um, and and my, my bill this year, I expanded to include wind energy components as well. I've gone, I've driven down the interstates enough between here and Iowa to see these large piles of, of used wind propellers piled up along the side of the road. It's pretty unsightly. And they're really, they take up a lot of room. Uh, what are we going to do with all these things? I, I, I think it's a legitimate question that needs to be answered. And um, so I'm, I'm sorry to see that I, I feel like it's negligent that um, in this Democrat bill that 
solar components weren't included in either one of these lists, whether it's for PFAS or um, the cadmium and the, and the lead. Um, I guess I'll end my comment there, Madam Chair, but um, I, I hope that um, in future years that um, this, sh this should be a priority uh, for everyone in this chamber um, and in this body. Thank you. Chair Hansen, any closing comments before we vote? Thank you, Madam Chair. It's, it's always interesting to hear about what's not in the bill, uh, and there are good things in the bill. Um, you know, uh, Representative Scott, I'd encourage, you know, the RFP is open right now for LCCMR, and this would be a great project to do research, and I'd be happy to work with you and, and Ms. Nash to see if we can figure out uh, some proposal for doing the scientific research on that, where it's third party, uh, sign, I think the university would probably be a great person, to, a great entity to be working on that. Just on, the, on that particular point, Madam Chair, I know you want to get going, but <laughs> I, I think uh, Representative Scott was nodding on that, that we could mm -hmm. work together on that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Representative Scott. Um, thank you. And, and uh, Representative Hansen, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at that. I'm not sure that research is needed. We know what's in these components, and we know that they're going to have to be disposed of. So I, I'm guessing there's probably already a body of research out there, but, but no, if that's a route to take, that's a route to take. But I don't, I don't think we should be delaying this when these, these panels are becoming, you, you know, their lifespan has ended and we have to now dispose of them. We have to know how to do that and, and take some precautions right now. But thank you. Madam Chair. All right. Uh, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what is in the bill are a number of proposals that deal with past problems. I mentioned MLCAT. Uh, I mentioned the lottery in lieu of. I mentioned pig's eye. Uh, those are some legacy issues that need to get resolved. And I'm hopeful that we could find bipartisan support on resolving those past problems. We talked about issues that, are, that we can see. There are things we can't see. We can't see PFAS. We can't see prions. We can't see, uh, I can see my phone's ringing. Uh, we can see, we can't see microplastics. But because we can't see them doesn't mean they're there and doesn't mean they have an impact on us or our environment. So with the surplus that we have, we have a one-time opportunity to deal with these past wrongs and help resolve current problems that are real and prepare a foundation for the future. <laughs> So I'm asking for your support. I'm asking for your ideas. Um, this is a good bill. Please vote yes. Well, thank you, Chair Hanson. This is a, a one-time opportunity with a surplus. So I just want to thank you for your, your work and your leadership and for the committee's work to protect our state environment and the natural resources. So Chair Hansen renews his motion that Senate File 4062, as amended, be recommended for placement on the general register. Ms. Anna, please take the vote. Chair Moran? Aye. Moran, aye. Vice Chair Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo, excused. Representative O'Neill? O'Neill, no. O'Neill, no. Representative Albright? Albright, no. Albright, no. Representative Becker-Finn? Aye. Becker-Finn, aye. Representative Bernardi? Bernardi, aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Eklund? Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hansen? Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hassan? Aye. aye. Hassan, aye. Representative Hurtas? Hurtas, no. Hurtas, no. Representative Hornstein? Hornstein, aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Johnson? Johnson, no. Johnson, no. Representative Krisha? Krisha, no. Krisha, no. Representative Liebling? Liebling, aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Lily, aye. Lily, aye. Representative Mariani? Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Representative Marquardt? Aye. Marquardt, aye. Representative Miller? No. Miller, no. Representative Nash? Nash, no. Nash, no. Representative Nelson? Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor? Noor, aye. Noor, aye. Representative Pulaski? Pulaski, aye. Pulaski, aye. Representative Petersburg? No. Petersburg, no. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Schultz? Aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Scott? No. Scott, no. And Representative Sundin? Sundin, aye. Sundin, aye. Madam Chair, that is 18 ayes and 10 nays. One to vote of 18 ayes and 4 nays. The motion prevails in the Senate. 
and 10 nays, with there being 18 ayes and 10 nays, the motion prevails, and Senate File 4062, as amended, is on to the floor. All right, so our next two bills on the agenda will be merged into House File 4608 for one omnibus bill on judiciary finance, civil law, and public safety. We will consider each bill and associated amendments and then lay the first one over until they are merged by motion. The first bill in this package is House File 3920, which is a supplemental judiciary finance, civil law, omnibus bill. Chair Becker Finn, would you like to move uh, the HF 2930 to get it before the committee? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, that is my motion. 3920. 3920. 3920. <laughs> yes, Madam Chair. I understand you have two authors amendment that you'd like to act on before you present your bill. Please move the A5 and tell us about it. Yep, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We'll move the A5 amendment. Um, the A5 amendment is a technical amendment, just clarifying some language around uh, the salary uh, additions for the judicial branch. Uh, because they are third branch of government, there are uh, some very specific ways we have to word things, and House Research recommended that we make this amendment. All right. Are there any questions on the amendment? Seeing no further questions, the A5 amendment is before us. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Next is the A7 amendment. Chair Becker Fan, please move it and proceed. Uh, yep, thank you, Madam Chair. I will move the A7 amendment. The A7 amendment is the civil law policy omnibus, uh, so we're combining that with the, the finance bill. I will note, um, since it was heard in committee, a couple things have been removed. Um, one of those is Representative Mueller's language around uh, GPS tracking, and that's because that language is already included in the public safety omnibus bill. Um, and then also removing Representative Hansen's snowmobile penalties bill and uh, Representative Feist bill that have already passed and been signed by the governor. So we didn't need that in the bill, so we took those out. All right, are there any questions on the amendment? Okay. Seeing no further questions, the A7 amendment is before us. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion prevails. Okay, Chair Becker Finn, please tell us about House File 3920 <laughs> as amended. I thank you, Madam Chair, and I I, so as, as I mentioned, um, because of the split in the Senate, uh, there is a Senate Judiciary Finance Committee, which is separate from their Civil Law Data and Policy Committee. So that's why we had separate omnibus bills. We're now combining those. Um, we'll, because we're in Ways and Means, I'll focus most of my uh, comments on the financial implications and the judi judiciary finance piece. Um, really, uh, throughout this biennium, our focus in this committee has been on uh, a focus on liberty and justice for all. Uh, that really has been our focus. You know, we, we say that every time we uh, say the Pledge of Allegiance, but uh, it really uh, comes to bear here in the Judiciary Finance Bill. And uh, one of the main things we wanted to do is make sure that um, whether your constitutional rights are upheld or not should not be determined by your access to wealth. And so with that, uh, one of the primary focuses of the funding in this bill is increasing funding both to public de the Board of Public Defense as well as civil legal services services. We really conceive of our justice system as a, a three-legged stool of the judicial branch, civil legal services, and the Board of Public Defense. And so we need to make sure each one of those legs of the stool is functioning well um, for the whole system to function well. And that, that has been our focus. So um, in the in 23, um, there's 140 million. And then in the tails, it's 300 million. That is a, a larger tails target than some folks got. But that's because really the recognition, especially for the Board of Public Defense, um, how important that is. We, uh, as folks are hopefully aware, uh, our public defenders have been never fully been funded uh, as an agency. And uh, what folks might not be aware of is that uh, providing public defense to citizens is actually something that is constitutionally required that we do. And it's constitutionally required that states fund that. And we have not, we've not up upheld that um, really ever in our state. And so that's really the, the biggest item in this bill is um, increase, increasing that base funding um, ongoing to the Board of Public Defense so that we can at least be meeting minimum 
caseload levels. Um, and that's against a public standard or um, national standards of what uh, public defense standards for caseload should be. Um, you know, I've heard some folks, because it's such a big number, you know, some folks have been like, oh, this must be the Cadillac plan. Mm -hmm. This is not the Cadillac plan. This is the bare minimum of what we need to do so that we have a functional vehicle. Uh, you know, right now, uh, things are really being held together with uh, hitchhiking and bumming rides, and we want to make sure that um, our public defense system is actually functioning well. And so that's, that's what this bill does. Uh, so in addition to that funding, uh, so it's an additional $50 million, uh, each year to the Board of Public Defense to meet those constitutional requirements. Um, there's also uh, judicial compensation increases that were requested uh, by the judicial branch. Um, those are met as well. Um, some small increases to the guardian ad litem, uh, as well as uh, some funding, uh, one-time funding on some file storage um, salary equity issues within the judicial branch. Um, the other main agency within our purview and judiciary is the Human Department of Human Rights. Um, so we also have funding to increase investigative capacity, um, track uh, incidents of uh, hate incidents, uh, and then um, increase outreach and bias response, uh, community outreach, really including the community and reaching out to folks so that we are getting a full picture of what's going on uh, in our state. Um, so those are kind of, uh, and then uh, one of the other, uh, a couple other more smaller numbers, but uh, setting up a board of appellate uh, counsel for parents. So when parents are, so folks remember last year we passed a bill to um, provide attorneys to parents who are mm -hmm. facing uh, losing custody of their children, um, losing their, their parental rights. And so this would provide a counsel for those parents at the uh, appellate level as well. Um, as far as uh, there's some other shifting a little bit with fines and fees, but not increasing any fees on the public. Um, that was really important to me, um, especially in this time of surplus. Uh, there is some, some changes to try to build some more fairness into things. Um, and then uh, one of the provisions, I think there were six bills uh, introduced to deal with this, but making it so that access to public court documents uh, remains uh it was free online for a limited amount of time while they were getting this new system up and running. Um, but we want to in, like extend that so that folks have access to public documents for free uh, ongoing. And so that's um, a lot of uh, bipartisan support um, on, on that work as well. Um, as far as the policy provisions, I know we're a little short for time, so I'll go quickly. Um, a lot of stuff on data. Um, I know that that's not exciting to a lot of people, um, but it is in our committee. Um, we included several things that were fully vetted and supported by the Data Practices Commission. For folks who are not familiar, the Data Practices Commission is uh, fully bipartisan. There's equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans on that commission, and we had um, unanimous support support on a couple of data provisions, um, many of them this year having to do with protecting the data around students, um, so around minors. Um, some boring, uh, Article 4 is all just on a uniform uh, Canadian Money Judgments Act, uh, UCC request, and then uh, Article 5 in Human Rights includes uh, the Crown Act, which you've already passed off the House floor, as well as preventing pay discrimination, um, a Representative Daniels bill uh, on closed captioning uh, for people who are blind, uh, and prohibiting racial and ethnic discrimination in organ transplants, and then uh, the Take Pride Act uh, carried by Representative Hollins. A um, couple other things around uh, changing notaries and changing uh, ability to change your name uh, after you get divorced, as well as Representative Scott's bill to clarify some uh, forfeiture technical changes. So that's the bill. Uh, happy to take questions. Um, I think, I can't remember the exact quote, but I think uh, Lee Scott uh, on our committee um, said it was a fairly decent bill, which I took, <laughs> I took as a, um, a, a pretty good review um, from my, my Republican lead. So uh, it's, it's a bill that we're proud of, and I'm happy to take questions, Madam Chair. But thank you so much for your presentation, uh, Chair Beckerfin. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Beckerfin. And um, it's a decent bill. Um, however, it would have been more decent had this been <laughs> a budget year. And it's, I mean, last year we increased judiciary spending by approximately $48.6 million. And this bill increases it um, by an additional $140 million and then 300 in the tails. 
So it's it's a very expensive bill, <laughs> but I do I do like some of the the more the policy provisions in here. I'm I'm very thankful that um, you uh, included the bill on um, on student data in the schools, and that's been worked on for a very long time. This bill's been scaled down a lot. Um, but we have nothing currently that protects that data, really, folks. And with the on the, ask, the onset of how much um, work our students are doing online, that is a troubling prospect. That there's really nothing governing, um, putting um, guardrails around um, what happens with that data. So I'm very thankful for that piece. And um, I don't disagree that there are priorities that. People need to have equal justice under the law. I just think this is, um, because this is not a budget year, I think, and, and, and the spending is so much greater, um, I think it could have been moderated a little bit more. But that's really my only comments, Madam Chair, and um, Madam Chair, <laughs> so thank you. Okay, I see no further questions. You know, one of the things that I found, since I don't sit on judiciary, is that I wrote down that you said the Public Defender Office has never been fully funded, but it's constitutional that we do so, but it has never been done. And so here we are with a surplus. This is an opportunity for us to really do something that constitutionally we should have always been doing. And so I just want to thank you, Chair Becca Finn, for your committee work to ensure that our system of justice is accessible to everyone, regardless of income. And with that, the Chair will lay over House File 3920 as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I will also note that the Senate also included the $50 million per year for the public defenders as well. So it is a bipartisan effort. Thank you, Madam Chair. So our last bill today is House File 4608, the Supplemental Public Safety Omnibus. Chair Mariani, would you like to move uh, House File 4608 be recommended for placement on the General Register? That is my motion, Madam Chair. Um, I believe you also have an author's amendment to get the bill in the shape that you'd like to present it. Um, Madam Chair, if it's okay, I'd like to hold off on that for a bit um, and then come back to it. Okay, why don't you proceed? Thank you. Madam Chair, members, um, this is a long bill. Uh, it's an important bill. I'm sure every chair comes up here tells you that, and they're telling the truth. Um, um, I have uh, tons of things to share with you, uh, but I'm afraid that time will allow us to do that fully. Uh, so I'll try to be as brief uh, as, as I can. Um, the bill um, covers a broad um, range of vitally important work uh, to keep uh, Minnesota safe um, and to maintain public safety. It is, uh, as Lee Johnson constantly reminds us, uh, lead in our committee, um, uh, one of the single most important functions of our government uh, at every level. Uh, this bill embraces uh, that, that responsibility. The bill does meet its target. Um, both um, in uh, uh, the immediate years as well as out into our, our tail years. Uh, there is some uh, shifting around of special revenue funds uh, that allow us a little bit more flexibility uh, to make the important investments uh, that we need uh, to make. Uh, it covers public safety, law enforcement, juvie justice, juvenile justice, criminal crime victim support, uh, supervision, probation, emergency management, corrections, labor trafficking, substance abuse, and more. Um, our two major uh, departments are the uh, Department of Corrections, the Department of Public Safety, and then there are a number of boards, like the Sentencing Guidelines Commission, uh, and the Pulse Board, and the Private Detective Board, uh, as well as a number of emergency management uh, uh, boards and entities uh, that we have responsibility for. Um, those of you um, who know me know that um, my approach to legislating uh, is to combine a good policy with strong uh, funding and to not apologize for those and to really insist that the two need to go together. Um, I'm approached, as all of you are, uh, for requests for all sorts of, of more uh, spending and funding, uh, much of which I agree with. 
Um, I do not agree in spending um, state uh, taxpayer dollars without a strong policy frame and while, without a strong evaluation and accountability frame. I believe that's what makes for best governance. Um, many of you also know I've, I've presented, uh, I lost track, I think I've presented 10 omnibus bills in the 32 years uh, that I've uh, served uh, uh, with you, um, and, um, and of which six um, uh, I was the chief uh, author. Um, right now, members, we have uh, some important public safety challenges, um, and I would submit that we keep thinking if we just double down on well, all the to the point where our uh, uh, rep representative Schumacher, can you mute yourself? <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Chair. I thought out. I was getting some help there. <laughs> I'm gonna break. Um, I was starting to say that uh, we we have some public safety uh, challenges and opportunities in our state, and you know, my reflection is that we keep thinking if we just keep doubling down on everything we've done uh, in the past and just do that only. Uh, in public safety and corrections, then we'll get it right. Um, however, uh, I think we'll get it right and we'll be safer uh, if we uh, honor those things at work, if we learn from them, and if we innovate uh, and do uh, better things. Uh, at the core of this bill is innovation. Um, I don't want us to go to our corners, which often we do when it comes to public safety. Um, as our preferred strategy to engage with one another and engage uh, with the public. Uh, I really want us to come out of our corners. I don't think uh, public safety um, is the kind of work, the corrections is the kind of work uh, where there needs to be uh, winners and losers. Uh, there's just no winning and losing when it comes to public safety and corrections. It's just doing the right thing, and the right thing is what's effective, and what's effective is what evidence in front of us tells us uh, should be effective. And in that, we should be honoring our current public safety systems uh, as well as demanding uh, that they do better. We honor our correction systems as well uh, as they do better. And so this bill looks to build capacity uh, uh, for things like law enforcement. Um, uh, and it also looks to build capacity for community-based uh, solutions. It expects those uh, to work really closely with one another. There's room for lots of good ideas, uh, and there are a lot of good ideas. There's room for things like uh, peace officer recruitment funds, uh, which could include retention and bonuses. This bill allows room for that. There's room uh, also for community violence prevention work. This bill provides for that. There's room for a historic appropriation of counties all across Minnesota for community supervision. Uh, and at the same time, there's room for ending the use of fees to pay for those services because the state is stepping up uh, to meet those costs. There's room for new penalties uh, to get uh, uh, tough for on wrongdoers. Um, and so this bill involves new penalties for labor trafficking and domestic abuse of offenders. And there's room for prison to employment programs so that former offenders can right themselves and give back uh, to their society. This bill asks you to seize the moment in front of us, and I ask you uh, to do that uh, as well. I'm not gonna go through all the appropriations, uh, members, but I want, do wanna highlight uh, several for you uh, quickly, if I can get to my page. That's done, gotta hit everything off, earmark, here we go, in public safety, uh, there's a $15 million emergency community safety grants in 2022 that reflects uh, this legislature's desire to do immediate responses to immediate challenges that Minnesotans uh, uh, face. Uh, the work to be funded here ranges from intervention to police recruitment uh, to police uh, community policing um, uh, enhancements to more investigators to mobile crisis teams the juvenile dimension, uh, uh, interventions. Uh, the bill uh, really smartly targets uh, public safety grants for, it turned out, 80 communities. These are uh, cities, counties, and townships with the highest crime and the highest growth in crime rates. So we did the data uh, crunching uh, on, on, um, on crime uh, incidences um, and trends, 
and we identified uh, 80 communities where the direction on that is going in the wrong way. It targets then resources uh, directly uh, for those co uh, communities, uh, but it also says that safety is uh, an entire statewide issue, and so it reserves half of these appropriations for other counties, uh, or rather other local entities uh, as well. Uh, we do that through several pots uh, of funds, uh, through the Department of Public Safety, mostly through the Office of Justice Programs. There's a local community innovation grants, $55 million in 23, $30 million in the base. Again, members, this is for cities, towns, counties, tribal governments, annual evaluations. In this case, it's for using for work uh, to be used on a broad array of issues that can range from co-responders to juvenile detention to mobile crisis teams. There is a local community policing grant, uh, 15 million and 23, 10 million and 24, 10 million and 25. Again, cities, towns, counties, tribal government for law enforcement use to recruit officers, for officer community uh, presence uh, enhancement, for crisis responsive teams, even for non or, or even for law enforcement to hire non uh, patrol folks so that they can free up uh, 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 licensed peace officers to be present uh, out, in, out in our communities. There's a local investigation grants of 15 million and 23, 10 million and 24, 10 million and 25 uh, to, uh, to, for law enforcement uh, to recruit detectives, investigators. Uh, peace officers to replace uh, those who will be transferred to that work. Uh, what we know is that uh, our, some of our best detectives, uh, most effective uh, investigators are those who have spent a number of years um, out on, on the street, if you will, uh, interacting. So often there's a movement, uh, but that creates uh, in order to clear uh, cases, which is critically important for public safety, but that creates a challenge in a whole, and so these funds could be used uh, for, the, for those purposes. Um, there's a local responder uh, grants program of $10 million into the base. Again, cities, town, uh, towns, counties, uh, and tribal governments. There's a transfer of $10 million to the opiate uh, epidemic uh, uh, fund for, to respond to that ongoing challenge. It's a horrible challenge uh, in our state. Uh, these are uh, focused uh, for greater Minnesota because of the incredibly huge disparate impact that that has on that, those parts of our state um, who face, uh, who have very minimal resources uh, to respond to. Uh, the bill creates, it doesn't just throw money. Uh, I don't believe in that. You shouldn't either. Uh, the state creates a public safety innovation board uh, Department of Public Safety to monitor crime trends, review research, inform the legislature, and inform the distribution uh, of these uh, grants uh, to provide us with good evaluation of their effectiveness. We do increase uh, capacity of the Office of Justice Programs because it's a big lift uh, that we're asking uh, these uh, good professionals there. There's investments in body camera uh, grants. Uh, this is particularly important for our smaller law enforcement units who are primarily, quite frankly, located outside of the Twin Cities uh, metro area. Uh, there's $9 million in 23 and $4.5 million uh, ongoing. Body camera storage, uh, an idea that came directly uh, from law enforcement, so the state will assume uh, the important responsibility of having that uniform uh, centralized storage uh, base for their uh, data that's six million and 23 and six million uh, annually. There's use of force uh, training with higher ed uh, um, involvement. Um, part of that was influenced by one of our colleagues in, in, in the uh, committee representative, Nevada, who was a retired law enforcement uh, person himself. Uh, 2.5 million, 23, 2.5 million uh, annually. There's a number of important uh, Bureau of Criminal Apprehension capacity building uh, to be able to partner and work with uh, our locals to solve um, uh, crimes, to do important forensics work. Uh, 3 million and 23, um, and then 3 million uh, ongoing. Um, that's just one part of the bill, but I won't do the details on the other. I'll just tell you quickly there are important investments in the 
investments, excuse me, in juvenile justice, focus on prevention grants, intervention grants, and mental health uh, and wellness grants, and those are built into the base uh, as well. There is also important investments in our uh, victim support. Uh, we should never forget those who have been harmed by crime. Um, it's a tough journey for them uh, to get back to be whole. We want them to be whole for all the moral reasons. We want them to be whole for all the important reasons in terms of building strong communities. They've taken a hit uh, in the last year under the former federal uh, White House administration uh, that really uh, uh, dings them uh, for the ability to have long-term capacity uh, to be able to work uh, directly with crime victims. And so we're filling that in, and we're, we're making that strong uh, out um, into the out years. Uh, and then finally, members, there's a uh, justice and re uh, reinvestment initiative work. Uh, this is authored by the uh, chair of this committee, uh, uh, Chair Moran. And uh, in a nutshell, it increases for four counties uh, using a grant program, so a new approach uh, um, uh, to replace the uh, current uh, formula that we've fallen behind on, and it is not necessarily informed by effective evidence-based uh, practices. This comes out of your work for having voted uh, to put into place, and this was a bipartisan effort uh, in both bodies, to put into place in our state an important review uh, process guided, facilitated by the Council of State Governments uh, for our county systems and our state um, uh, partners uh, to uh, look at uh, the effectiveness of our funding programs and our uh, practices that we use uh, for that. And so what this bill will do is it, it uh, takes really important aggressive steps to get us to fully fund what will be, in essence, a new formula. There's 10 million and 23 on top of the current base. Uh, that's 10 million uh, new dollars um, for our, our county-based uh, systems. 25 million uh, in 24, and then 38 million in 25 as the full formula uh, moves in. There's still some ongoing important work that needs to inform that, and that's why we're staging it in. There's a big caseload study. Uh, process that uh, the entire system will be is embarking on, uh, very similar to what the courts do, so that we have an important, smart way to invest uh, uh, our our dollars. Everything else in the bill are, is quote unquote small, but really important stuff, like creating the uh, um, missing and murdered uh, black women uh, and girls, similar to what we did with our indigenous um, um, uh, brothers and sisters. Um, in the last couple of years. There's a really important, I know it's boring, but it's a really important data management system replacement, uh, big ticket item uh, for Department of Corrections, uh, guided by our Office of Legislative uh, Auditor, our uh, recommend recommendations to modernize uh, that system now. Uh, there are some important investments sprinkled throughout, sprinkled as to, to demeaning, uh, distributed uh, throughout, including body armor uh, access, for our firefighters um, and our EMTs. Uh, members, uh, there's so much more uh, to share Mariani. about that, but I'm gonna stop there. Yes. And it's probably appropriate at this point to move the chair's um, uh, author's amendment. Your committee has done some awesome work. There's a lot of good um, provisions within the CRBO. Uh, I'm just wondering, because we run up against some time here. Um, Representative Johnson, how much time do you think you would need I think I can get done in 10 minutes or less. Okay, okay beautiful. Um, so really quickly, just a very high level, can you uh, move your A33 amendment? Madam Chair, I would move the A33 amendment. It has roughly four provisions in it. There's some movement of special revenue funds uh, in correction, or special revenue funds uh, in order to make sure that we make some important steps of funding that armor uh, radio system uh, from our special revenue fund, our telecommunications fund. There's two Department of Corrections requests um, that are technical in nature in terms of making sure that that uh, new movement uh, toward a quote unquote new formula is distributed uh, well, and that we're also uh, making sure we're, uh, that individuals at work 
uh, from one county system and transfer it to the other that they maintain their rights. Uh, there's a GPS tracking uh, device uh, uh, amendment that allows us to um, to have um, that allows our law enforcement to use GPS tracking systems um, for uh, instances of carjacking. Um, and then there's the one that gives me the biggest pain, which is it removes the felony murder law um, uh, provisions. Um, I'd love to have an hour with you, but I only have 30 seconds. Uh, there's an ingrained injustice, in my, in my opinion, where we literally have mostly women, mostly women of color in our state, who are doing uh, like life sentences for murder uh, convictions um, who didn't kill anyone. Uh, who were part of um, a process, it, it, it varies, you know, it could be everything from just having been dragged along, uh, often by uh, a partner, often by an abusive partner, and in some cases where that partner uh, is going to be doing, uh, on paper, less time uh, than, than the uh, person they dragged into. Uh, there's a big movement across the, the country uh, the rest of the world has jettisoned uh, this medieval uh, approach uh, to justice. Uh, it was my hope. Uh, there's bipartisan support for this, uh, both here and in the Senate. It was my hope that we can move aggressively with that uh, this year after studying it for a whole year. Uh, ho however, um, this isn't throwing shade on anyone. I'm just sharing it. You know, um, our uh, key important uh, sectors of our, of our prosecution uh, community just didn't feel comfortable uh, at this point. They want to be able to vet this more. Uh, we're going to hold them to that. Um, and so the amendment uh, strips out that, that assertive um, uh, limitation of that, or in my opinion, archaic law, and puts in, into place a continuation of, of a task force uh, with stronger directives to come back with recommendations uh, for you all uh, in the next uh, year. So, Madam Chair, that's my uh, amendment. Thank I would you. ask for your support. Are there any questions to the amendment? Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just really quickly, Chair Mariani, um, was the concern with aiding and abetting <coughs> felony murder, was it the retroactivity and the resentencing that was of concern that we raised in committee? Uh, Chair Mariani. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill, those are part of the uh, concerns. Thank you. That's all. Okay. Seeing no further questions, the 833 amendment is before us. All those in favor to the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, aye. say nay. The motion prevails. Okay, I think there was another amendment that you're not going to uh, be offering, Chair Mariani, is that okay, correct? That's, that's correct, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. So, um, to the bill. Do we have any questions uh, or general comments on the bill? Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Moran, uh, Chair Mariani, I want to thank you for this uh, interesting bill. Well, you had mentioned earlier it's, uh, we have a bad habit of going to our corners and that you're trying to come out of the corner. I think you're coming from the middle of the ring and going back to your corner for the same stuff that's been pushed for the past previous three years that has been been rejected by the Senate and by a lot of the law enforcement community that understand public safety. I just going to ask a couple questions and I have a couple comments. Um, first, I want to thank you for the body camera grants. Uh, they are important. What we have found out with the body cameras is that 99.9% .9 of the complaints that are filed against peace officers are false. A lot of times when they find out there's a video or even audio of the incident, the person making the complaints just goes away. Um, because they know that, uh, or as, once they see it, they realize that the officer did not make any mistakes. So I want to thank you for the uh, body camera grants. But the concern I have on them is that could you just mention briefly a couple of the policy issues that are required to go along with that, that uh, have some, that the law enforcement community has some issues with? Yeah. I'm sorry, is there a question? Uh, I was just wondering if you could, uh, over the last few years, there's been a push for some uh, body camera policy language requirements 
um, that have been uh, law enforcement communities have some issues with some of them, and they, you're pushing them again in order to do this grant. I just wondered if you could uh, mention some of the policies that you're pushing that go along in order to get the grants that the departments have to do. Uh, uh, Mariani. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Johnson, uh, Madam Chair. The big thing has to do with when, um, when we would expect body camera footage to be shared um, in two circumstances. Uh, one, uh, well, in the circumstance of, 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 um, of deadly force, um, uh, but in the situation where family members uh, want to have access uh, to the body uh, camera uh, footage. Um, the bill would require that um, in those cases, uh, no later than five days after the incident, uh, that that footage can be shared um, uh, with, um, with family members. Um, and uh, however, a chief law enforcement officer uh, can still deny sharing that uh, language, uh, or rather that, that footage with family members um, if there is still important investigative work uh, that they are conducting. Uh, in that instance, uh, they are required to notify family members that they can appeal that decision to district court uh, for review. So there's a careful uh, balancing of the very, quite frankly, uh, incredibly humane uh, desire uh, for someone to, uh, who just lost a loved one to be able to have uh, access uh, to that footage five days, not before, but five days after they've lost that loved one. This follows a emerging practice that's happening across the nation. Um, states is, is uh, different from ours as North Dakota. Uh, passed something like this even uh, tougher than this. Uh, there is concern uh, that uh, law enforcement representatives shared with us. We uh, attempt to answer that by creating that five-day window as well as uh, the ability to still hold off uh, and then balance that off with a uh, appeal process. There's also the sharing of that with the general public, uh, 14 days. Uh, again, similar circumstances with uh, ability for local law enforcement uh, to uh, say, no, we're, we're still looking into this, can't share it right now, uh, and then the issue can still go then to district court. Uh, members, think about what just happened a few weeks ago, and think about where we all would be right now if we hadn't seen that footage of Amir Locke's killing. I think we would see action on the streets. That's not what we want. You know, family members are distraught, they're hurt, but they at least know visually. They don't know everything, but they know visually. The officer uh, and officers involved uh, are not operating in a total vacuum of darkness and smoke. Uh, with folks, you know, horribly perhaps second-guessing what they did, uh, there's something there for them to be able to hang on to. There's a balancing act here that's critically important. I get law enforcement uh, certain voices. Um, it's not all, uh, because in some jurisdictions across the country, they've proactively done this on their own. I get why they may not want to be told uh, to do it. This is a case of leading our friends into good practices and members. Again, it's the state setting expectations. You all, based on human decency, I would argue, based on human rights, based on public safety, when you're about to hand over millions of dollars on an ongoing basis, to help our local law enforcement um, acquire that needed equipment, which Representative Johnson, I think, I don't know about the 99.9% uh, case, I'd like to see that study, but I do know that uh, body camera footage uh, can be as helpful for law enforcement, because many law enforcement folks 
are working awfully hard to follow good policies. And so members, it's an incredibly good balance. Um, law enforcement isn't necessarily banging on our door saying no, 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 but they're not saying yes, yes, yes. For me, as a legislator has been for a around here a long time, I could tell you, you can't legislate unless you pull your friends in the direction that you need to pull them. And eventually they will conform, they will adapt, and they will continue to do good work. That's what's happening in other jurisdictions, in other uh, states that have passed this kind of language, uh, in other locals where they've just taken the initiative to do it themselves. Representative Johnson. <clears throat> Chairman, Representative Marianne Amatiga. Chance at another question, see if we can have an answer a lot shorter. I'll we work are out. Short, <laughs> we are short on time because there is a lot of information in this bill, and I want to go through it. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, you have some of the grants uh, to hire, for law enforcement agency to hire uh, non licensed personnel to do things. Mm -hmm. I'm looking back in my career and looking at what we have with our licensed personnel and our non-licensed personnel, what they do. I'm just trying to figure out what the non-licensed personnel would be doing that licensed personnel are doing now because they are required, required to do a lot of that because they are licensed. One of the few, few areas that there is that I've seen, and that is in uh, service of papers in the sheriff's office, the sheriff, the uh, police departments do not generally serve papers, but the uh, sheriff's office is required to in those court papers. And there is a lot, there's a lot of them that are served, but a lot of them are required licensed officer to serve them. Mm -hmm. But there, there is a few. So I'm just wondering what you're looking at to having the unlicensed do that the licensed officers are doing now. Yeah, fair question. Um, yeah, fair question, Madam Chair. Just, I will be brief. Um, First, I would say trust your locals. Uh, trust your local cities, counties, town, uh, uh, counties townships, um, and tribal governments uh, who are going to be the ones who are applying for these funds, uh, who are going to be applying them, and are going to be working with law enforcement, because law enforcement is consistently named in all of these provisions. I would submit that I don't think law enforcement is going to look to use funds to, to do work that is appropriate professional uh, peace officer work. Uh, having said all that, I could tell you my chief uh, told me uh, directly that what's helpful, uh, one of the things that's helpful for him is to be able to free up uh, licensed peace officers who are doing really important data management and filing work, uh, et cetera, that can be done by others in, in his central office so that he can get them out uh, into the communities. I expect that that would be the kind of work uh, that would happen, and again, I would trust our, our local electeds and our local law enforcement officials to make that call. Representative Johnson. Well, uh, Chairman and Representative Mariana, if your department's using law licensed officers to do data entry and filing, I think it's time for a new police chief, because that's not their duty. Well, we're going to get a new police chief, although I, I think we have a really fine police chief in uh, Chief uh, Axel. You know, you often do what you got to do. Uh, there, are legal, there are legal requirements. Um, and he's got to be able to deploy his people in a way to meet those legal demands. Okay. Representative Johnson. I just have a few more comments on this uh, so-called public safety bill. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to wrap my head around, we have a responsibility that we're falling way behind and not paying our counties the rates at uh, the 50% requirement in statute for a probation system. Um, and now it's going to a grant program where one county can get a lot more than another county or one agency can get more than another agency, although they're doing the same work because it's a grant instead of this is what, looking at their duties and their responsibilities, the amount of work they do and a, and a formula. Um, that grant, the word grant should not be there because it's our responsibility to do the work and, and to make those payments. Of another concern, and I, I, one thing I liked in the governor's recommendations that's not in this bill is, uh, I 
the domestic violence and sexual assault intervention programs. The governor requested uh, $12.5 million. There's really nothing in this bill to stop for the intervention of domestic abuse and sexual assault, which is a serious issue. Um, I'm very disappointed in that. I'm disappointed that only a fraction, not, not even 50 percent, or barely 50 percent of uh, Rep Representative Marcourt's bill is in here. Emergency management. $3 million for that program is peanuts for what's needed. Yet this bill only has 1.5. Very disappointing. Because our local emergency management personnel, they do the planning and setting things in place to get things done properly and to make sure things are working right. And to have the equipment and the, and the plans in place and the training that goes along with that with all the departments, the fire departments, EMS, law enforcement, they're required to do trainings every year. That also costs, takes funds. There's many different, other different things that are missing. I'm disappointed that the interstate transport reimbursement, which is also a governor's recommendation, along with uh, recommendation that needs to be done. Department of Corrections is no longer, it's a lot of times, no, go, not going to go pick up people on their warrants, leaving it up to the local sher sheriff's office to go pick up the person at, at a, a county expense, even though it's a Department of Corrections warrant, and they're not reimbursed. That's left out of this bill. <clears throat> but I think one of the, another egregious thing, right now, under current law, the counties pay 65% of the cost of detention of a juvenile. Most counties do not want, only use the juvenile detention system when they have to, because they don't like using it. They'd prefer not to if they can, but sometimes there's no choice. Right now in Hennepin County, in the city of Minneapolis, they're not doing any detention of juveniles. We're doing most of the armed robberies on our cars, the carjackings. That's right, they're armed robberies. And they're just being let loose again. I have a story of dealing with a juvenile when I was an officer, caught him, caught the juvenile doing a burglary, caught him inside the store, two o'clock in the morning, duffel bag full of a lot of stuff, brought him to the sheriff's office, called mom and dad to come and pick him up. I spent five minutes trying to uh, explain to dad that, yes, I have your son. He kept insisting that his son was in bed until I gave his son the phone and to have dad come and please pick me up so they don't have to put me in a detention center. Dad wouldn't believe that, was, that his son was even there, even though he said he was looking at him in his bedroom. We need parents to be parents again, which will help with our juvenile system. But in this bill, it changes it. It takes that 35% that the state pays, away from, diverts it from giving it to the counties to help associate those costs, making the counties pay 100% of the bill, and taking that savings and put it in a grant for other things. We have a over close to $10 billion surplus, and we're charging counties and forcing counties to, to pay for a grant that the state is doing. <clears throat> counties have set their budgets. This is taking money away from the counties and funding another program that we don't know if it's going to work or not. Making the counties pay for the grant and telling them what it's going to be used for. There's so many more things I can talk about. We'll discuss them on the floor of the House. All I can say is that I'm going to ask my member, members to vote no on this bill because it's not a public safety bill. It uh, it's, doesn't hold those who commit crime accountable. 
it just it doesn't uh, there's some stuff to help victims it does not help law enforcement every time there's something for law enforcement in the form of grants there's four or five six other things that can take the money that could be used for law enforcement and public safety and actually gives them to those who have committed the crime programs for that the governor had requested over $9 million for BCA for lab, for forensics and analysis to help solve some of these crimes that especially happen in the metro area. The homicides, the shootings, the gunshots. This bill only provides about 18% of that funding request. If we don't get those who are committing the crimes off the street, having the officers to investigate them, having the ability of law enforcement and the, the, the people behind it, the analysts, the lab techs, the officers on the street to actually do the crimes or investigate the crimes, this bill is going to do nothing for public safety. Well, last night, I just happened to be out standing outside and witnessed a pursuit going down Kellogg Avenue. The officer, the officer went two blocks and shut everything down because the car he was trying to pursue went through three stoplights that were red. The officer quit. People, if we don't start doing some policies that can actually turn around and hold those that are committing these crimes and doing these dangerous acts accountable, we're going backwards. And unfortunately, this bill, we go backwards. Thank you. All right, uh, Representative Miller. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I actually have a quick question for you. and. Uh, so I have a, a son with autism, and so he asks every day, so what are we doing today, Tim? And he wants to know the schedule, and when he asks it, I realize that I'm probably on the spectrum sometime as well. <laughs> so uh, the way I, if you could just please oblige me, the way I see it is, is we're going until 1045, and then we have scheduled 1 o'clock. Is that a hard 1 o'clock? Are we, because there's other things going on today, I just kind of want to know how I juggle your my time. my time. So, what does it look like if we if we continue on past this morning? So, thank you, the, uh, uh, Representative Miller, thank you for the question. Um, and if all goes well, uh, we can go a little bit over ten forty five, at least by ten minutes. Um, if we find that we are not able to do that, we will recess until um, one o'clock, or because we don't know what's going to happen on the floor into the call of the chair. But our hope is that we come back at 1 o'clock. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think we'll probably come back, just so you know. <laughs> um, I've been on public safety since I first got elected, and I think this is... So you have a lot of questions. Well, th there's a lot of money being spent here, Madam Chair, and so I, I, have, a few, I have a few concerns. So... Um, and, and Chair Mariani knows he, we, uh, we work pretty well together and uh, iron sharpens iron. So we're spending $200 million in this fiscal year that we've already appropriated money for, the budget's already passed, and $320 million in the tails. Um, but what's interesting, and that's a lot of money, obviously, that's a lot. But what's interesting to me are the things uh, that are very public safety related that did not get funded. And I'm, I'm looking at the, the spreadsheet here. And under the state fire marshal on line 22, it says bomb squad deficiency. So my question is, it's not a lot of money, it, you know, especially when we're spending $200 million in this fiscal and $320 million in the tails, but we didn't fund the bomb squad deficiency at all. It's a very small amount, and I'm wondering, is there, have they been made whole some other way, Chair Mariani, or is that still outstanding? Chair Mariani. Madam, Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill, I 
don't understand the outstanding part. There was a request uh, for uh, state funds to um, um, augment um, this uh, particular uh, um, work, uh, just like there were requests for all sorts of other projects, like the forensics work that uh, Representative Johnson just uh, mentioned, where the BCA uh, strives to help locals to be able to clear uh, crimes. Um, it's it's simply a matter um, for me and for um, um, the members who supported um, this bill. It, it comes down to a matter of you know your priorities and what's more important. And we can absolutely um, disagree about that, but um, it's really no more magical than that. Um, I'm sorry, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay, well, then the bomb squad's not important. Uh, it is a deficiency request, which is a little bit above most of these general requests, so I would make that point, and it's it's 150000 in this fiscal. I don't know how we couldn't find $150,000 to make them whole. Okay, it's a deficiency for the state fire marshal. In any case, um, I know... Lee Johnson mentioned this, but I'm going to mention it again because we actually have the superintendent here with us. And, um, you know, I've had the great opportunity to visit the BCA since I first got elected many, many times. And Superintendent Evans has been very gracious and, um, you know, spent time both here in St. Paul and up in Bemidji. And when we talked at great length, he went into great detail about why he needed 44 new forensic scientists and how important that was to the work that they do. And uh, Lee Johnson had mentioned that. They wanted $9.7 million to do that. Um, but we've only funded them at the level of uh, $1.5 million. In my math, that looks like about seven scientists, not 44. Um, and I could be wrong on my math, but I'm, I'm usually pretty close. So um, that's of concern. Um, and I, the line below that, line 32, uh, under the BCA, says simulation trailers. So this is use of force. Use of force is something, Chair Mariani, that we have talked about at great length. This is something that we've uh, looked at changing policy and law. And, and here's an opportunity, Chair Mariani, where they wanted $4 million to send simulation trailers around to do use of force training. And again, there's a zero here. So we're not funding that at all. Um, so we're not funding the bomb squad. We're not funding use of force training um, in this very hands-on way in the simulation trailer. I, I don't really, and, you know, and they go all over the state. They, they're a trailer, so the BCA takes them around and they do a very lifelike realistic use of force training, which our officers absolutely need. So I'm not really sure why we've got a zero for the bomb squad and a zero for the simulation trailers. And we're only adding, at best, seven forensic scientists to solve all these violent, violent crimes. I don't understand that. Um, apparently, as you said about bomb squads, it's just not a priority, or there are other priorities that are higher. Let me go further down the spreadsheet, Chair Mariani, and under the- Representative O'Neill. I want you to hold that. Yes, ma'am. I want you to just hold it, because I think we're going to go into recess. I think we probably will. Yes, yes, ma'am. So we're going to do that, members. Um, we're going to take a break for now. Uh, we're going to go to session. Uh, we'll pick up from here and finish up the remainder um, of the agenda, starting off with Representative O'Neill. Um, and so we'll come back here uh, from the floor. So we plan to return at 1 o'clock. That's the plan. But please watch your e uh, emails in case things should change. Also, this room right here is going to be uh, in use from 11.30 to 12.30. So you need to pack up all your things that you, that you would like to keep. Um, and we will pick those up when we come back from recess. With that, we are now in recess.